Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. I just want to share with you uh, a debate that I listened to uh, the other day uh, by uh, N.T. Wright and John Dominic Crossan. Uh, uh, it was a lecture, it was a debate on the resurrection of Christ at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary um, a year or two ago. Uh, you can find it on the YouTube channel uh, Thomist Theist um, and if you type in N.T. Wright and Dominic Cross on debate on the resurrection of Jesus uh, you should find uh, a link to the debate and uh, so I just want to share with you my thoughts on the debate I, I thoroughly enjoyed the debate but before I do I'm just going to open in prayer Father God I thank you for this day and I thank you for your love and I thank you for your grace. I give you the praise and the glory and the honor. And um, I pray, Father, that you bless uh, this discussion, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, the first thing I want to say is I've given N.T. Wright some severe criticism recently. Uh, basically, I do think uh, that he's gone off the rails concerning the doctrine of salvation. Now, I know there are many out there who are anti right fans and regard him as a great scholar, and I regard him as a great scholar too. I think he is one of the most outstanding New Testament scholars today. So I don't want to take away the fact that anti right is a brilliant scholar. And he's not only a brilliant scholar, he's a very likable person. But I do think that he's taken the metaphor of Israel to too far and applied it too much to his exegesis. And that has blurred and helping to blur people's understanding of personal salvation. And that is heretical. And um, if he continues to do that, he, he, Tom, uh, you're a heretic. I don't want to say that to such an eminent man. But if you are blurred in people's understanding of salvation, that's a very dangerous thing. Having said that, this debate I thoroughly enjoyed. I enjoyed N.T. Wright's scholarship on this particular uh, debate. And I enjoyed Dominic Crosser. Both of them are whimsical, highly, uh, highly articulate, absolutely brilliant scholars in their field and bring impeccable scholarship to what they're saying and so it was refreshing uh, to see these two brilliant scholars go head to head. Um, I think N.T. Wright's thesis in the debate was that as we look at Judaism uh, in the first century that there was a shift in the trajectory of Judaism that Christianity seemed to present a number of new features that Judaism didn't have and those features needed to be accounted for and so one of the main keys of N.T. Wright's expose or defense of the resurrection is that there was a two key split in the doctrine of the resurrection which was definitely a massive change in Judaism because Judaism expected a resurrection but it was the at the end of time <coughs> here we have a two split in the Christianity we have the resurrection of Jesus and then we're going to have the resurrection of the dead in the at the end of time so there's a two-way split there from general uh, Judaism. Also resurrection is central in Christianity where it was on the periphery of the very Judaistic sects. And the other mutation was that nobody expected the Messiah to die and rise as the case in Christianity. There were a couple of other issues that anti right brought up but I think though that the key was the issue about the two-way split uh, in the idea of what a, the resurrection was about uh, whereas Judaism 
it didn't center on the resurrection as much as Christianity and it didn't have this two-way split and so Dominic Crossan acknowledges that this is a very significant and very important point that N.T. Wright he believes has proved his case and that this needs to be accounted for Dominic Crossan counteracts this issue that uh, what what um, N.T. Wright is saying and brings the debate about interpretation of the resurrection whether it is literal or symbolic and time and time again Dominic Crossan brings the point and says well it doesn't matter whether the resurrection is literal or whether it is symbolic for Dominic Crossan what matters is what do we do with it what do we do with the resurrection whatever your position is what do you do with it how does it work out in practice for Dominic Crossan the political and social implications of the resurrection are absolutely paramount and he wants to know what's the cash value of your particular belief N.T. Wright then comes in and corrects Dominic Crossan and says well actually I can get you where you want to go but I think you will get I can get you where you want to go better if you take a literal view of the resurrection uh, Dominic Crossan doesn't agree with that but that's the kind of discussion uh, that they had There was a discussion about the nature of the body in Pauline theology uh, in the debate um, where N.T. Wright makes the point that the modern scholarship has generally emphasized that when Paul is on about the body it's generally about the psyche and the whole person and he right made the emphasis that that's just a misconception of of uh, Pauline theology that there are undertones of a resurrection of physicality uh, in Pauline theology So, for, NT, uh, for Dominic Crossan, the political situation of first century Judaism, about how it played out, Christianity played out, in terms of its, re it, its relationship to Rome, because there was a, a contrast made, I think also by N.T. Wright, between Caesar who was seen as God, Caesar's kingdom, Caesar's power and Dominic Crossan and N.T. Wright I think both made the point in different ways that when Jesus uh, was proclaimed uh, as the risen Lord that this was really a, a counter cultural thing going on politically completely denying the kingship the authority of Caesar and so I think that both of them wanted to consider the, the cash question well how does this resurrection whether symbolic or physical whether how does it play out in our understanding of politics and, and society today and, and, and to put in Dominic Crossan's uh, words um, 
how do the rogues, or something like this, not exactly his words, but generally speaking, he said, how the rogues get justice. That's what I want to know, he says, concerning your view of the resurrection. How do the rogues get justice? So what are my thoughts about the debate? I thought the debate was wonderful. I, I thought that Dominic Crossan is a wonderful guy. He, he just really makes me laugh. He's, he, he's so funny and he's so warm uh, and he's so lovable. And N.T. Wright uh, makes me stand in awe sometimes at the sheer knowledge that he brings out concerning uh, first century Judaism. Uh, you can see that he completely has grasped his subject. And when he did this debate, it wasn't long ago before he'd finished his book uh, on the resurrection. So all the knowledge that he gained through that research came into this debate. Um, I think what I got out of the debate is that there is a strong argument to press to skeptics and that argument is this how do you explain the rise of Christianity how do you explain the different theological trajectories of Christianity as opposed to Judaism for example Paul uh, N.T. writes two sphere resurrection how do you account for that as opposed to the one sphere resurrection in various parts of Judaism and so there are questions that the skeptics I think need to, to ask and the burden of proof is often put on the Christian to prove the resurrection but I think it works two ways I think there's a burden of proof on the skeptic to answer some very tough historical questions and the question the questions that the skeptic needs to answer is how did first century Judaism metamorphose into Christianity and how did Christianity come about what is your historical explanation and what I think is that those explanations that come don't really take into consideration all the data so for example you get um, you will get uh, Richard Carrier and he will say that um, Jesus is just part of the Mithridine and rising gods. And two problem, two three problems with Richard Carrier, the atheist, uh, who's the main scholar for the atheists these days on the resurrection. Three problems there. He uses the Bayes theorem, so his pre his method, historical method, is just incorrect. Nobody uses the Bayes theorem uh, in historical inquiry or if they do that it's a very rare thing but um, the base theorem basically comes down to the computation that you put into to your assess of what you want to assess so you you basically put in the probabilities of a particular historical situation based on uh, the basic factual information that you can gain and then from that basic factual information the likelihood probability of X and Y and then you put that together and you get the conclusion but the X and Y the putting the information together of the possible probability of X and Y still comes down to the fact that you've got to do the groundwork as a historian to be able to put your computation in so you need to do the groundwork as a historian and the assessment of data in order to then to start to say X and Y put X and Y together you get whatever in other words unless your historical method begins with is objective or using the basic scholarly tools that are being used your computations are just going to be subjective so in other words the Bayes theorem is no excuse for doing good historical research and presenting good historical evidence and that's why most historians if not yeah, the vast majority 
hardly anyone uses it. That's why hardly anyone uses the Bayes' theorem. If you want to read up on that, I would read uh, Lycona's The Resurrection of Jesus and read the first uh, 100 pages and you'll get some exposition on the Bayes' theorem and how, how it's been debunked as a historical method. So the atheist scholars such as Richard Carrier would come <coughs> to the question of the resurrection using the Bayes' theorem. That can be easily discounted. <coughs> the next thing is Richard Carrier would then present um, a thesis and the thesis would be that over time there has been a development of myth uh, through the texts and again this is a misrepresentation of the data there is already even within the first couple of years of the death and resurrection of Jesus historical material that counters what a Richard Carrier would say so we have in 1st Corinthians chapter 15 in the first few verses we have Paul saying I this is what I received of first importance that word first importance uh, scholars will tell you and if you if you want to get a lecture on this listen to um, trying to think what his name is uh, yeah JP Moreland you listen to JP Moreland on the resurrection uh, and he'll give you some details about this and also uh, James Dunn's uh, Jesus Remembered listen to some of his lectures he's definitely not on our side but uh, he's one of the most eminent scholars on G historical Jesus studies go and listen to him uh, and uh, you'll get some of this kind of information that will help you but in the first few verses Paul says uh, of which I've received a first importance that word first importance scholars will tell you goes right back as a tradition right to within uh, the uh, first importance was written in one Corinth the letter of 1 Corinthians on the resurrection Paul's uh, writing uh, in that chapter a defense of the resurrection <laughs> there were those in in Corinth who uh, were in, uh, influenced by Greek philosophy and Greek philosophy didn't take seriously the human body and so people were saying that the resurrection had already taken place it was more like a ghost thing and it wasn't a physical body and so Paul is counteracting that by saying that Christ really did die and rise again and there were witnesses for this and right at the beginning of his argument he says of first importance now this word of first importance can be traced back to rabbi literature and rabbi understanding of historical how to pass on information historically it goes right back as a tradition to the um, within a few years of Jesus his death and resurrection because in the time of Jesus rabbis would have um, what they would do they would have individuals in their group who would memorize and be able to pass on the historical tradition of the rabbi and when they came before the rabbi to regurgitate all the rabbi's teaching they would end or start I can't remember which one but it was start or end but they would say I received this of first importance so the atheist scholars such as Richard Carrier uh, debunked on methodology and debunked on data the, da the data is showing us that right early on there was a clear understanding of the death and resurrection of Christ and it did not move into some kind of mythological development as, an, as Richard Carrier would, would say so so what am I trying to say here I think what I'm trying to say is that the skeptics need to take into consideration the data of first century Judaism um, I'm always surprised at Richard Carrier's quotations the atheist scholar of uh, first century literature every time I've checked Richard Carrier's sources when he's quoted Philo 
when he's quoted uh, the Song of Isaiah, and I have checked, and I check his sources, I check his quotations, every time I check this atheist scholar out, he always misquotes the text. Um, a classic example is he quotes Philo, and he says that in the Philo text, there is a mention of Jesus. And within his lecture, he will actually put the text of Philo up with the name of Jesus, Jesus in it. And people reading that think that the text Jesus within is actually in Philo, the word Jesus. But actually, if you read Philo, the word Jesus is not in there. The way what Richard Carrier does, he does an exegetical dance by going to the Old Testament and then pulling it all together and saying, look, there's a connection here and it's a reference to Jesus, and there was a reference to an early Jesus in Philo, ho ho ho, um, you know, this is mythological stuff, the early church took these ideas and they developed them, but when he quotes his text and he puts, he puts the, what Philo says, he puts the word Jesus in, but it's not actually in the text, so there's a gross miss misrepresentation to the public about Philo and it's not as clear as Richard Carrier would present and this is a typical example of the shoddy scholarship within uh, the skeptical community concerning the concerning the scholarship of the resurrection of Christ the misquotation of text the mis the misrepresentation of scholarship within this area uh, of historical Jesus studies and the resurrection of Christ uh, and so I, I just pick on Richard Carrier there because I know a little bit about him but there are other scholars that I could talk about the point is this that in the debate N.T. Wright brings these issues about the way first century Judaism is and the sudden change from the first century Judaism into the metamorphosis of Christianity and the skeptic needs to grapple with this and answer it and they use the wrong methodology very often but they don't deal with the data that's the point that I'm trying to get at the data is not honestly assessed and if it was honestly assessed there would be some serious serious thinking to be done uh, about why there was an empty tomb why the early church said they saw Jesus rise from the dead and I think you uh, as a person a skeptic and as a Christian owe it to yourself to grapple and to study uh, the scholarship on the resurrection of Christ and, and to get to grips to that and so that you're clear either why you believe or why you reject uh, and I think that this debate if you listen to this debate it will help you on your way I thoroughly enjoyed it two uh, really good people uh, and uh, I would encourage you to to go and listen to it that's all I have to say on this I hope that's been a blessing to you and a help to you today okay so that was just off the cuff of my head um, so uh, I'll see if I can I'm going to um, give you uh, excuse me Okay, um, I'm going to just link for you um, this article. Uh, it's called Survey of Historical Jesus Studies from Ramirez to Wright by Dr. Michael Burr, is Assistant Professor of New Testament Studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. You can get this article at BibleBible.org article. Okay. Uh, and that will help you to get started on historical Jesus studies 
and he'll have lots of references that you can go and read okay so I'd encourage you to to um, to get into that yeah uh, and to study uh, and to to get yourself equipped uh, in this area uh, I would also go on I think it's um, You go on to the website Apologetics 315, Apologetics 315, and you'll see uh, a lot of good stuff there. So that that's um, apologetics uh, three one five. So I would encourage you to to get down there and uh, sorry about this. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, there seems to be something wrong with the Google Hangout. Testing. Yeah, well, we're back on now, yeah. So, look at the website um, and you'll find a lot of resources there um, I would encourage you to also go to Richard Barkham's website and you'll find some helpful information there and Mike Lacone and Gary Habermas uh, are Christian apologists uh, on the minimal fact approach of the resurrection they'll be helpful um, and um, I've done quite a lot of stuff on the resurrection. Have a look at what I've done. Just type in Jason Burns, the resurrection, and you'll find a lot of stuff there. Okay? So I hope that's been a blessing to you, and I uh, hope to see you soon, and God bless you. Take care.